Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, but not more. Today, we are beginning our discussion of Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt. So, before I get into this, I actually wanted to talk about reading memoir in general. Oh, before I get into that, I wanted to talk about the debacle of my video on Friday with the poll and everything. So one, I found out that I can't put polls in my cards on YouTube. Not sure why. Not sure if that's not a thing anymore. Not sure if I just don't have enough subscribers. It is what it is. But, <laughs> and then the other thing is like a logistics thing with like this time space continuum. I realized that if I got my votes on Friday, it would be too late by the time I tallied them to like be able to prep for the video that following Friday because you guys are a week behind me. So the Monday that you guys see this is actually one week in the past for me because I need to like edit and make, make the content and blah blah blah. Anyway, point being, I'm now switching to Monday polls and they're going to be on my social media so you'll find it in my Instagram stories. I'll do the quiz, which there's no right answer, I'll just count up the votes. And then I'll also have it as a poll on my Twitter going all week, um, or Monday through Thursday. So you can vote there. And I hate it when people like push their other social media platforms, but the reality is it's the only place that I can really do it. So, <laughs> so go ahead and vote. I'll have the polls up for this week um, on my social media. You can find me at a lovely jaunt everywhere at a lovely jaunt. And uh, you can pick out what you want to happen for Friday's video content. And because this is one week in the past for me, you won't see whatever you vote on until two weeks Friday. That's okay, we'll pretend like time doesn't exist and that's not confusing. It's all right. One way or the other, I'll get to your votes and we will talk about fairy tales, we'll talk about myths, we'll talk about Sherlock Holmes, we might bring in some new types of short stories. I might even pick out a particular short story for you to be able to vote on. Anyway, enough of the introductory material. Let's talk about memoir. So Angela's Ashes is obviously a very famous memoir, and it was the winner of the Pulitzer Prize, according to the Gold Seal. And I totally understand why from reading, I'm about a quarter of the way through, I read the first quarter of this book. It is amazing. There's a part of me that has a hard time when I approach something like memoir in the sense of like, how do I analyze it? How do I talk about the meaning of the work? And yet memoir sits in a different place compared to biography or autobiography or like a pure, straight clinical nonfiction. This is obviously true. It's his true life experience, but memoir layers upon it a level of artistry and literary um, literary style to to fully express the experience of living. I think stories are particularly powerful as for us because they tell us how to be and they tell us who we are. And that's why memoir as this blend between a literary style and a true narrative really becomes an effective style of literature for us. So even though it's a true experience. I'm still going to talk about themes. I'm still going to talk about meaning making because it was written with a particular style, a particular emphasis, particular word choices in order to draw out the meaningfulness of these life experiences. In a similar vein, I was actually just updating my Goodreads. Um, so it's all fully accurate to my current library. I don't have all of the books that I've ever read listed on there because I didn't ever keep up with it really very well previous to this. Part of it was because I had so little memory on my phone, it was not worth it for me to have the app, but I got a new phone, and so now I have the app on my phone, which means I keep up with it more. So I redid my whole library, and I got to um, Anne Frank's diary, and it's like, well, what do you rate that? How do you rank that? Is there any way for me to give it somehow something other than five stars, even though, you know, it's not necessarily Shakespeare, but it's so raw and it's so real and it's so true. You know, it's just her diary. She never meant it for, meant for it to be anything other than her own, you know, self-expression. And yet it's such an essential part of our narrative as humans. It's such an essential way for us to learn about ourselves and learn about the world around us, learn about our capacity for evil and for good, for patience and for grace. 
and you know how and and by the same token like that some of the struggle that I'm having with approaching this text in the way that I approach fictional texts and just like novels and stuff like that so with that preamble out of the way I wanted to dive into some of the themes that I'm starting to see develop in the story in the opening sequence I really like the way in which he's really contrasting the pub and the church um, and they're really held in tension side by side and contrasted with each other juxtaposed if you will that key word of all intellectuals everywhere if you're talking about art you're gonna use the word juxtaposed and I just did but they really are held in tension with each other these two sort of cornerstones of not only his life experience but the, seemingly the cultural experience of his town and and just of maybe even Irish life the the influence of the church the spirituality the faith the religion the moralizing the source of charity that it will be for the rest of his life in poverty and then the sort of the power of alcohol and alcoholism and the way that that's a blight on his life and yet both have very similar roles and experiences for the day-to-day -day life of the people. I think he really captures the sort of bleeding watercolor memory of childhood where scene kind of bleeds into scene. He does a good job of putting it into sort of obviously chronological order, which is helpful for those of us who are reading the book, while still sort of capturing that essence of timelessness, you know, and I think that's the way that memory works for us is we can dip in and out of various times and skip around. We don't have to experience it in that narrative logical, narrative logical, dash logical, framework in order to understand um, our, uh, ourselves and our own experiences, but we do need it narrative and logical when we hear it from somebody else. And yet he doesn't lose that way in which time bleeds and memory leads into memory and the edges of things are not really clear in childhood. And I think that's really true kind of across the board, like the the edges of your identity between yourself and your siblings and your parents, it's not really super clear. The edges of time, the edges of a moment moving into the next moment are not really clear. And I and the, his style choices really capture that. There's also this theme running through of um, someone owning a song or someone owning a story. So there's a song that his mom sings, and that's her song. There's a myth, an Irish myth, myth that his father tells him, and that's his story. And he doesn't really want those boundaries of, of ownership or proprietary ship sort of violated. And I think what we see with children of trauma, uh, speaking from personal experience, there's a lot of, you know, addiction and alcohol um, and drugs sort of in my extended family. So the language of addiction and recovery and codependency is very familiar to me. And so reading these experiences is very familiar to me as well. But there's a real violation of boundaries. And we see it with the way that the father, of course, interacts with the children. It's, you know, he comes home drunk in the middle of the night and he makes them like stand up and pretend to be proud Irish soldiers and sing these sort of anthems of, of cultural identity. And that's this violation of boundary. And so we see this character almost reactively uh, responding to the violations of other boundaries that he has sort of made up for himself. And I think that has a lot to do with his coalescing identity and the way in which he's trying to deal with the trauma of addiction that's in his family and in his life. We also see it tied again at a cultural level, so not just at an interpersonal level, but at a cultural level, which I already kind of referenced with his father wanting to build an Irish cultural identity, especially when they're living in New York. But, you know, they have their, their Jewish neighbor, Freddie, and then also the mother, and him talking about, you know, language, vocabulary, accent, all of these things become very, very important because it's culture and identity, and it's that sort of way in which who you are and where you came from makes you comprehensive to yourself and to others. Or, otherwise opaque to yourself and to others. So it's both a way to transmit meaning, but it's also a way to like create boundaries and borders and, and distinctions, separation between people. And we see that when he 
visits, visits his neighbors who are Jewish, and I think they're probably speaking Yiddish to each other, and he s keeps saying, like, they made noises that he didn't understand. He doesn't even understand it at the level of, like, oh, they're speaking another language. But, of course, he's, he's a little boy. But it, it also serves to separate. And then, yeah, that ties in with this idea of the repeated difference in the use of language. And yet we see that, and this is one of my favorite concepts, the way in which humanity transcends difference. And we see that in the charity and loving kindness that the neighbors give, whether it's the Italian grocer across the street or whether, again, it's their Jewish neighbor in the same building as them helping to take care of the kids in this family that's just going through trauma just crazy, tragic life trauma. Now I want to transition to kind of life lessons because I think this is something that's really important that's sort of not talked about enough when we're talking about people being victims of trauma and victimhood. And I think there's a way in which, well, I'll just speak from personal experience because I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a counselor, I don't have a degree in any of that, so I can't really give you advice uh, on that level because I'm, I'm not trained in that and I don't know your life. One of the best things that I've been able to do for myself is one, not worrying about myself as a victim, coming to terms with my story, coming to terms with my hurt, being honest with myself about certain things that have hurt me, and then being able to say, okay, that is truth, but what am I going to do with it? Who am I in the midst of trauma and suffering and, and difficulty? And how am I going to, you know, pay it forward and move it forward in reality and in life? And there is, there, and there should be time and space for healing, for grief, for processing, but it should be seasonal in my opinion. I don't think you, uh, or at least for me, I don't want my identity to be wrapped up in my victimhood. I want my identity to be Alexandra, who I am as a whole person, as a whole and unique person, far more complex than merely some of the mistakes and hurts that other people may have you know, caused against me. I'm more than that. I'm not merely my victimhood. And, um, and I think that there's a way in which it can uh, hold you back if it becomes a part of your fixed identity. Then you don't have a growth mindset anymore and you can't move beyond it. And one of the things that I think is really, really helpful is having this idea of like, I'm responsible for everything in my life, everything. Even when it seems like it's a senseless tragedy that comes out of nowhere, that's completely random, that you know a tornado rips through your house and completely destroys it. I'm responsible. And the way that that plays out is like, did I cause the tornado? No. Did I make mistakes and like violate the laws of the vengeful God who's now punishing me? No. But the point is, what will I do now? In this circumstance, how am I going to be responsible for the domain that is in front of me, this destroyed house? Maybe neighbors are, have a destroyed house. What next? What am I going to choose to be responsible for that I'm going to put in my purview and my hospices to be able to move forward in life? Um, and that what make, that's what makes you sort of the person that, one, other people can rely on and other people can help to depend on, and also a person who's able to be strong enough to move through tragedy. Because life will bring it to you. Life will buffet you. Life will give you a hard time. I don't care who you are, how wealthy you are, how privileged you are, how what golden star you were born under. Life will bring you tragedy. And so the question is, do you have the faculties to be able to encounter life when that comes? So that was a little lecture from yours truly. What's up? Uh, and I hope, I hope you enjoyed it. And I think, you know, the, these kinds of stories are really, really hard to read, but they're really, really worth reading because what it shows you is how strong you can be. My personal experience is not at all close to the horrendous, senseless, mindless tragedy that this family is facing. And yet it can give me hope because it can show me how strong I can be. And it sort of puts a path in, in the ground before you and, and you can set your feet upon that path to sort of say, okay, the human spirit is actually stronger 
than I think it might be, that I can handle more than I think I can handle. Um, and so anyway, beautiful, wonderful, horrible, <laughs> all of those things. So until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.